Heather Fesnack with Ackerman LLP. We represent the appellee in this matter. I'd like, this is a pretty straightforward foreclosure litigation, so I'd like to address some of the questions raised by the panel. Um, with respect to the final judgment amounts and the argument that there's no evidence, we disagree. Jay Vent, who is the corporate representative, properly testified as to his personal knowledge that he knew the amounts due and owing under the loan. That's in the transcript at page 33. There was testimony developed as to how he knew the amounts. He was shown a copy of the proposed final judgment. A copy was given to the borrower's counsel. And what proposed final judgment would that be? It's, it is not, it's not an exhibit, but what nor is it. What was the date of the trial? I'm sorry, Your Honor. What was the date of the trial? November 1. What was the date of the final judgment? To, December 12, 2012. What evidence is there that what he was shown was the final judgment that was entered a month and a half later? There is no direct What evidence link. is there as to the amounts due and owing from this borrower? Mr. Vent did properly testify he knew the amounts that were due and what owing. What amount? <laughs> it was not is, read is he, into the record. He kept them out to himself. It, it was not read into the record. But the trial court as the finder of fact and the same trial judge the who trial entered the, the order. The finder of fact based on what evidence as to amounts <laughs> due and owing? Trial testimony from Mr. Vent that the amounts, he knew the amounts, the Let's amounts were set forward. Let's talk circularly then. What final judgment did the trial judge rely on? What document as a, I mean, I'm assuming, well, the, it's, a the, I'm assuming it's a proposed final judgment because was. there was no final judgment yet. So someone, the witness had in front of him a piece of paper that apparently was labeled final judgment. Correct. And do these numbers seem to be correct? Yes. Correct. What did the judge look at after that moment? I can't speak to exactly what the judge looked at, but the principle reflects the principle amount due and owing and the partial payment history that was introduced. The interest that's reflected on the proposed final judgment runs from date of default until November 1, 2012. So it's clear that no additional interest was accrued or entered as of that date. And again, I think it's important to note that the borrower's counsel basically consented to this testimony. They didn't object to the amounts. They didn't object to the testimony. They didn't object to what amount, counsel? They didn't object to the testimony of Mr. Venn. Look at this piece of paper. You agree that the figures seem to be correct, yes. What's objectionable? At that point, what's objectionable? Nothing has been tendered to the trial court to establish an amount due and owing. Defense counsel questioned him as to the two amounts and said, how do you know that these amounts are accurate? And he testified as to the basis of his knowledge. She was in possession of a copy of the proposed order. If she had a problem with his testimony or the basis for his testimony, she should have raised it at that time. And after that testimony, what happened to that piece of paper? I assume the trial court kept their copy of it, Your Honor. But the record doesn't show that. The record does not reflect that. It was not admitted. The record does not, although there is competent testimony that the numbers that were provided in the proposed final judgment were accurate. And there's- And if they walked out in the attorney's briefcase, the trial court had competent, substantial evidence to sign a judgment on. That is true. And we would argue that if this was an issue for the court, then this case is almost identical to the Sass case in which it's clear that in the Sass case, the plaintiff proved the elements of a foreclosure action and the entitlement to damages. And there was a question as to only amount of damages. And a subsequent hearing was held to determine those amount of damages. And that would be the case here. You said that on cross-examination, the other side asked about the amounts due and owing? Yes. Can you find that for me in the transcript? Yes, Your Honor. Page 34 is where the witness testifies that the figures are accurate. And cross-examination begins on 35. She says, when you access a computer record, are you seeing records by others? I'm 
Sorry, Your Honor, I can't really see that. Well, I so thought she questioned him as to the basis for his knowledge, and he testified the basis for my knowledge is the review of the business record. So she did not, opposing counsel did not question as to the accuracy of the numbers or how he knew about specific numbers. All right, it's a three-page cross-examination, and I don't see it. Okay, I, I apologize, Your Honor. I did think that there was questions, she did raise questions with him about. On page 36, there is a question beginning on line six, I'm sorry, line eight. The answer is, I'm seeing entries that are made contemporaneously with events such as property tax disbursements, taxes or payments received, and so forth. Maybe that's what you're referring to. I am, Your Honor, and who maintains the computer systems. Okay, so how does that establish the amount of interest or the principal amount due? It doesn't specifically speak to those exact amounts, Your Honor, but it does show that the, he did testify earlier as to the basis for his knowledge of the amounts. If we ultimately conclude that this case has to be reversed, what happens? Your Honor, if this case is ultimately reversed on the basis of the amounts of final judgment, we would request that the case be remanded for a hearing just as to final judgment amounts. It's clear. Why? Why should, first of all, why? Second of all, do you have any authority to support that if, in fact, there's been a trial and your client didn't establish any amount due and owing? And I think the Sass case speaks exactly to that issue. If anyone had objected to it contemporaneously and at the time, we would have been able to introduce a payment history, but nobody objected to the entry of the amounts. There was objections going back and forth, motions for a directed verdict, motions, you know, for an involuntary dismissal based on plaintiff's failure to establish its case. That issue wasn't raised then. It's an issue that could have easily been cured with the payment history that was listed on the exhibit list. I don't know how often the rule gets invoked. I know I've seen a few cases here and there, but the rule 1530 does make it pretty clear. You don't have to object to challenge sufficiency of the evidence. That's true, Your Honor. My recollection is you didn't argue or address that in your brief, or I shouldn't say your brief, but your client's brief. Yes, well, Your Honor, that issue was raised on their reply brief, but I would say that in this case— I thought it was raised in their initial brief. It may have also—certainly the sufficiency of the final judgment evidence was raised in their initial brief. So how come your client didn't respond to that argument? I think the answer is, Your Honor, that we believe there was sufficient evidence based on Mr. Venn's testimony. Assume for the sake of argument you lose. So you are conceding that this gets reversed for entry of judgment in favor of the defendant? No, no, we do not concede that. But you didn't argue it. We're arguing it here, Your Honor. Is that sufficient? Yes, we believe it is sufficient, Your Honor. So you're asking us to exercise our discretion to allow you to do something that wasn't done before, which sounds an awful lot like what the defendant was asking for in the trial court as far as the exercise of discretion to amend the pleadings, exercise of discretion to have an expert witness, and the court said no. So you're asking us to exercise discretion to allow you to make an argument that you haven't made in the brief. And by the way, I find intriguing the appellant's argument that the judge let your witness go get more documentary evidence after the plaintiff rested its case. Yes, and I'm happy to address that issue, Your Honor. Okay. With respect to the final judgment, again, we believe this case is very close to the Sass case in which the proof of the right to foreclosure had been proved and there was just an issue as to the amount owed. Here, the borrower's admitted default. I'll discuss the standing issue in a second. But it's clear that, and we believe it's clear, the evidence reflects standing to foreclose, notice of default, borrowers admit default, borrowers admit they don't know the amounts that are due, they couldn't have introduced any contrary testimony. So we would argue that in this case, the case taken as a whole, in the interest of justice, we would ask it to be remanded just as to the amounts due and owing. With respect to the notice of default, Your Honor, Mr. Vent did testify that the pre-acceleration notice of default was sent. That was included on the plaintiff's exhibit list. The pre-acceleration notice of default sent before the complaint was filed. Mr. Vent testified there were multiple letters. Only one letter was introduced. Was on the disclosure list where specific, was specific mention made as to the notice of default? On the exhibit list. And what was the date on the exhibit list? Was it the one that he actually used at trial, the first one? 
No, it was not. The exhibit list referenced a notice of default that was sent prior to the inception of a foreclosure action. A, a different letter was introduced initially. When defense counsel raised it as an issue, plaintiff's counsel said, and this is on page 78 of the transcript, um, Your Honor, I would like to have a chance to recall my witness to address these issues. The judge said, well, let's, the argument ensued, and plaintiff's counsel at page 81 said, there are multiple letters, we'd be happy to file them with the court. At that point, the court then considered plaintiff's request to reopen their case and introduce this additional evidence. No judgment had been entered at that time, and the court, in its discretion, allowed them to introduce that additional document. Again, borrower's counsel had already testified that they'd never recalled receiving any notice of default. They didn't recall the one that had already been introduced into evidence. They, offered, they would not then have been able to offer any contrary testimony. And in the interest of, the, of trying the case on the merits of the case, the court allowed them to introduce this additional document into evidence. But again, we don't believe that the court departed from a position of neutrality in directing plaintiffs on how to, to conduct their case or a line of questioning or questioning the witness itself. Plaintiff's counsel was the one that requested to put their witness back on the stand, and plaintiff's counsel was the one that suggested the way would be happy to file the notes to the court. The court said, can you file them now? If you can file them now, then get them. And so we, we believe that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in that case. With respect to standing, there's been a lot of discussion. The original, it's true there was a lost note count in which plaintiffs alleged the note was in our possession, and now it's unable to be located. The original note endorsed in blank was located. And additionally, the copy of the note endorsed in blank was attached to the complaint. The lost note count was dropped. Also included in exhibit two of the trial exhibits, there was an assignment of mortgage to the plaintiff that predates the complaint. So it seems that there is sufficient evidence in this case to establish the plaintiff is standing here. So plaintiff has, has established its right to stand. Again, it can move even though the complaint alleged owner and holder, it is entitled, the plaintiff was entitled to move as the holder. The copy of the note attached to the complaint reflects that the blank endorsement was present at the inception of the complaint. Plaintiff filed the original note. Plaintiff also attached to the complaint and filed with the trial court the, an assignment of mortgage and the note. The assignment also reflects a transfer of the note that predates the complaint. None of the, there was no additional testimony that was presented that in any way questioned plaintiff's standing to foreclose. And to the extent uh, the borrowers raised the issue of amending their affirmative defenses or introducing the testimony of the mortgage forensic expert, all that testimony runs to the owner of the note. And, and that's an irrelevant issue here because plaintiff was moving as holder of the note. Plaintiff, the, the court and the law do not require ownership status. Plaintiff's own witness testified it wasn't the owner of the note, it was the holder of the note. So amending affirmative defenses or allowing testimony that goes strictly to who owns the note would have been irrelevant and futile to the defense in this case. So we don't believe that there was an error in that, in refusing to allow after you know, a 2008 case right on the eve of trial, affirmative defenses and, and a new witness, especially when those issues don't actually go to the defense of the case. Before you sit down, I want you uh, to have the opportunity to address one concern, that, one other concern that I have, yes, Your Honor. which is relating to the uh, SAS case. Yes. Because I know you're relying on it as being controlling as to what could happen on remand. I think it may be distinguishable, and that's why I want to make sure you have the chance to address it. In the SAS case, the witness testified based on some business records that were not admitted, and the witness testified as to the exact amounts due and owing. Right. The defendant objected to the testimony, and the court overruled the objection. It seems to me that is different from what we have here, because you have the trial court affirmatively um, of overruling an objection, challenging the adequacy of the uh, knowledge of the witness. Whereas here, we don't have an objection, which of course is a distinguishing factor in your favor, but we also don't have the test, the specific testimony establishing the dollar amounts that did exist in SAS. So I think the ruling in SAS, Judge Volante wrote the opinion, I don't remember who else was on it, but the dis uh, judges Wallace and Black, uh, the evidence was there, but it was hearsay evidence, and the judge overruled the hearsay objection. 
Had the judge sustained the objection, then the bank would have potentially been able to fix that error. Here, there is no evidence as to dollar amount. So tell me, tell me why you think SAS is still controlling. I would argue that our witness did testify, and I believe that now what the, the borrowers are really saying, disregard Mr. Venn's testimony, that is hearsay. And we would say, you should have objected to hearsay at that time. He did testify, and everyone was in agreement as to the document that was set forth as the proposed judgment, and then the amounts were due and owing. Nobody had any questions. The borrowers themselves testified they were in default, and they had no idea the amounts that were due and owing. So there was no, the, Mr. Vent was a subject to a cross-examination. Nobody really drilled down onto, uh, opposing counsel did not drill down onto the amounts due and owing. It was not a contested issue. And if the borrowers' counsel now want to come back and say, oh, we didn't object to it at the time, we were fine with it at the time, we could have, we didn't, we didn't question anybody no, on I it. I think they're we saying they laid a trap and your client fell into it. But, it, but Your Honor, we and shouldn't the, be encouraging. The law generally doesn't encourage that, but a sufficiency of the evidence argument is a viable legal argument. And I believe that there's a case, um, if I could be permitted, Your Honor. I believe there's a case that says, um, in a similar context, that it was the Williams v. Lowe case, Your Honor, in which um, the defense counsel uh, uh, brought out some, uh, some testimony of, of crack cocaine addiction, which everyone knew was questionable, but his counsel chose not to raise it as an issue at that time, waited until the jury left and said, I think I need to move for a mistrial. I, and, and the court said, well, that seems like that. You're a skilled attorney. That seems like it's a judgment call, and we're not going to reward you for that kind of behavior. You don't get the benefit of sitting on your objection when you knew it was an issue, waiting until after the fact, and then saying, oh, I want a mistrial on this. And that's the exact same situation here. Nobody really contested the issues because there were so many other issues, and nobody was actually going to challenge the amounts due in LA. Yeah, but isn't that your burden of proof? It is. That's and we your would... burden. That is a fact you must prove. And we would argue that Mr. Vent's testimony that is to the accuracy of the numbers plus the partial payment plus the fact that multiple full payment histories were in the trial record and the court was available to the court to rely on them was All sufficient. Right. What, what amount due and owing is reflected in the payment history records that were admitted? Well, at the very least, what's the principal and about $66,000 in escrow. Plus, there were multiple attorney's fees and uh, corporate advances and, and additional documents. So it's clear, and again, nobody was challenged, the, the borrowers themselves didn't challenge the amounts due and owing, testified they couldn't possibly. So it's, 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 it, to the extent there is an error here, it's harmless error. So you're arguing that you do have proof of an amount of indebtedness, but you concede that it is an erroneous amount, but yet there is some evidence of indebtedness. There is evidence. The and principal it should go amount. back to the trial court to determine the correct amount of indebtedness. That is our argument, Your Honor. Especially in a case where there's been no contesting of the amounts still in Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be very brief. Judge Silberman, you just stated that if we were guilty of anything, it may be that we had laid a trap and they fell into it. If you recall a few moments ago, plaintiff's counsel got up here and said, this is a simple foreclosure case, duty breach, causation, and damages. I don't know how their failure to put on any evidence of damages was somehow a trap that we laid. And I want to point to some language that you included in the Korea case. And it was to the effect that these claims had been languishing for years, and plaintiff was fully aware of their burden of proof. Plaintiff is fully aware of their burden of proof. Duty, breach, causation, damages, conditions, precedent. This case was pending for four years. They had four years to prepare for this trial, to get the evidence they needed to prove their case, and they simply didn't do it. They didn't bring the right breach letter. They didn't bring any evidence of the amounts that were due and owing. They didn't bring any evidence of standing. This court has no obligation to give them a mulligan or a do-over when on three different issues of a very simple foreclosure case, they completely failed to bring any evidence to prove those elements. 
I want to address some of the misstatements that plaintiff's counsel made. The 2010 breach letter was the only letter that was produced in discovery. It was the only is, letter. Is there record evidence of that? Yes, and it's, it's cited in the brief in our facts section. It is the is only that, letter. Is that reflected in the record? Yes, on it is, it's citations to the record. Okay. It is the only evidence. It is the only document that was exchanged. She is correct that the witness and exhibit list simply, I believe, said just breach later. But then there was an exchange of the exhibits. And I believe counsel will agree that the only breach letter that was exchanged when there was an exchange of exhibits was the 2010 breach letter. It was also the only letter that they came prepared to present that day. So any argument that there were these other letters, you didn't bring them that day. You only got the opportunity to put those letters on when the court suggested to you what you needed to do to prove that element of your case. Secondly, she misstated about the assignment of mortgage as some sort of evidence of standing. That assignment of mortgage was never introduced into evidence, never discussed by the witness or marked for identification. Yes, it's attached to their complaint, but that doesn't get it into evidence simply because you attach it to your complaint. So any argument that that's what they used to prove their standing is not supported by the record because they never moved it into, into evidence. They departed from that and simply relied on the testimony of Mr. Vent that that assignment is not correct, that this case was, this loan was actually transferred into a separate trust who is not the plaintiff in this case. And finally, if Jay Vent is the one who knew the amounts due and owing, then he's the only one in the, who has those amounts in his head and nobody here in this courtroom can come up with any evidence to support those final judgment figures. The Correa case is the applicable case. The Sass case is distinguishable because as exactly as Judge Silberman pointed out, in that case they had put on some sort of evidence, albeit hearsay evidence was, which was objected to. Here there was no evidence put on and there is no reason to reward a plaintiff and give them a second chance to prove their case when they didn't bother to bring the evidence they needed after four years of litigation. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both.